and welcome back. Uh, in this tutorial, I want to discuss a couple of the uh, several ways that uh, Project Dog Waffle allows you to load images into the program. Uh, I'm talking about existing files, images that uh, perhaps you took from a digital camera. So here's an example uh, of uh, a top shot of a coffee mug I just took this morning. And uh, in fact, this one is in uh, our, uh, not, not in our program, but uh, in a very popular program called Irfan View that I highly recommend also as a companion to Dog Waffle. Um, Irfan View is a free program for home use. And if you use the L key, it will rotate it left. So if you have the vertical orientation here, right R for right, and then eventually I'll have it the way I want it. Now, uh, maybe I want to just work with this image uh, at this size and I could resize this and also use the minus key to resample it down a little bit. For quick testing, that might be sufficient and I could just copy that into the clipboard. Right? I don't necessarily have to save it or load it from a file. So that's a, a very common way to work with it too. If you go to the edit menu, this is the German version, Bearbeiten, but uh, the edit menu would have uh, control uh, control C for copy or streng C uh, to co uh, for kopieren uh, and so when you copy that image at this size <coughs> or actually probably at just whatever the internal size is you can then go and paste that into dog waffle you can use control V um, or you can go to the image menu and there's a couple of uh, options in the clipboard uh, sub menu and one of them is control V here to paste the new image um, and, and that will basically create a new, uh, a new image buffer, but you can also paste it into the existing image buffer. So paste into image will not resize it. And so if you have an image that's smaller than your current frame here, um, it, will, it will just fit into the portion it can. And then otherwise, uh, same thing, if it's, if it's too big, it will just put a portion of it in. And you can see here, I, I barely have just the rim of the, the cup. This is actually a, a picture of a coffee mug that was done at, I think, 8 megapixels, so it's very high resolution. And so the better option would be to actually go to the Control V option, which will remind us that we're about to lose this, this current image and say, yep, okay, let's do that. And it creates a new image and allocates all that. It shows it as is at full size. So we can perhaps squeeze it here. This option, uh, sh this is the default at 100%. But uh, if you want to see the whole image, we can fit the image to the window. Uh, function key F4 will do that too. And then so with that, you see the full picture. And then of course, from there on, you do what you want to do with that picture, decorating it, adding some frame around it, like a wooden frame. That's a nice feature under the image menu here, frame your work, right? Um, so lots of different things that you might want to do starting from a photograph, starting from a picture, uh, like this one here, adding the frame. I'm gonna exit out of that though. But let's, let's take a look at other ways to get the image in. This is one way, it's through the clipboard, right? And it could be putting that image into the image buffer, as we just did here. Or it could be, actually, maybe you have an image in the clipboard and you'd rather put it into the, um, into the brush. So there is an option similar to what we just did here with the image clipboard. There's an option in the brush as well, brush clipboard. And so you can paste from the clipboard into the brush. So let's do that. And that same image that we had is now in the brush. And it's, it's very large and it's a large custom image, uh, custom brush. So I can set the opacity of the brush to full, so I see it fully opaque. And that's really a technique that we use to stamp it down if, you, if, we, have to, if we have that image and we want to stamp it down somewhere. Right? Let's in fact undo this. Let's disable the preview, that's the PRV button here. Right? And so let's say uh, we want to grab just this portion. I consider one of the eyes, there's two eyes here looking at me. Uh, this came out of the drip coffee, the Senseo coffee. And, uh, and somehow there's a smiley face down here too. So I guess this coffee is meant to make me happy this morning. And um, one thing I want to do now is to grab this eye, uh, perhaps with the magic wand, or let's grab the rectangular, let's take the oval selection tool. With the oval selection, I can go into the middle approximately of the eye and then kind of drag the, uh, the marquee circle or oval around it. And you see the, the marching ants. If, if it's not easily seen, what you can do is go to the selection menu and, and overlay alpha to get a better idea of where the selection is and where it's not. 
right? And you can also store that, of course. You can store the selection from the selection menu, store alpha. The alpha channel shows you where what is actually selected uh, in white and what is not selected in black. All right, let's move that aside. Um, so <coughs> let's disable this uh, overlay alpha mode. The selection being there, we can just grab that as a custom brush. We can pick that up directly from the brush menu, control B. Use the selection as brush. Use selected, like selected pixels as brush. So this selection that we have here, we can use that as a brush. Pick that up like that, right? And at that point, I can enable the preview. And sure enough, I have that image that used to be here. It's still there in the background, but <coughs> I have it now also in my brush, custom brush. And I might want to store that to work with it a little bit. Maybe I want to manage uh, a copy of that to, to do other things to it. So one thing I might want to do is um, to, to change the hue. Like there's a hue saturation and value I can adjust here. So I could give it a little bit more of an orangey or reddish or greenish tint. Um, you can, in fact, uh, even overdrive the saturation here. Let's get the saturation even higher. Right, so you can get a kind of a greenish tint like that. <clears throat> There's lots of other things you might want to do with that, and that image could also uh, need to be saved. So uh, not only can we import an image through the clipboard like here we did, and we can import it uh, through the clipboard as well into the brush, and we picked an image that we had in the selection, but you can also save that image from here. Right? And you can therefore also open an image directly here. So that's one place where if you want an image ultimately in your brush as a custom image brush, um, you don't have to work it through the file menu. You can go directly on the brush menu and load the image straight into the brush. When you work with custom brushes a lot, you'll want to manage them also in the browse media area. So click on that. Tack, put this tag down, and then so you, you can uh, you can basically uh, create your collection of brushes, different favorites and different categories there. You can create your own additional categories. And uh, I'm going to go here and uh, save media in this uh, default of favorites, and I'm going to call this happy coffee. All right, so that's going to be happy coffee. Oops, not, there you, not coffee. So coffee. There you go, happy coffee. All right, so, so that image is uh, now saved. There it is. And I can always uh, switch between one and another. I can click on my hot dog, and I can click on my uh, beach balls, and then I can go back to the hot, happy coffee, and I have this brush there. All right, so, so the idea is uh, we want in this tutorial to see a couple of other ways to load images, right? And so let's go back to the basics now. Let's go to the very typical way to load an image, which is you go to the... Let me disable this preview quick here. Let's, we go to the file and open, right? And what you open is an image um, that could be of different types. And there's basically three categories. If you look at this, uh, the type selection, you got a default targa. And uh, if, you, if you go and navigate to a place where you actually have targa files, and I'm not sure where they are, uh, that would be typically wherever you save them. TGA files is what we uh, deal with uh, by default. Those are the, the sort of the internal preferred format for dog waffle. Um, and so if we go to maybe here, I'm sure we'll have a, an image or two that we saved somewhere. There you go. There's a sprite sheet. There's a fishy. Let's see. OK, let's open that one. All right. One of the things, though, is that <coughs> the, the images that are in TGA format, um, Windows doesn't know how to show you a thumbnail for that. Um, so you, you may want to add, there is actually a plugin uh, in our, on our website you can download. If you're on Windows XP, you can add uh, um, a tool to see that. But if you have a, an image in other formats, like um, uh, JPEG uh, from a digital camera, most likely it will be JPEG, or maybe a PNG image, TIFF, and a couple of others, uh, BMP files, of course, bitmap files. Uh, instead of using this Targa format, what you could use is the automatic format. That will use a feature called uh, the conversion tool. <coughs> Convert.exe is the file. And that conversion tool actually came from ImageMagick. So we have that included with the distribution and installation of DogWaffle. It's a free image viewer and converter in this case. We just focus on the conversion. So we can actually load over 60 different formats um, and, and turn that temporarily into a Targa and then load that in. And then there's also a third format, which is the layered format. Now, the layered format is our own native layered format. 
It's not a PSD file, it's not a layered TIFF, it's our own layered format. And uh, so when you work with layered formats, with layered images um, in Dogwaffle, and at some point you want to save that, and this progress, you don't want to flatten it and be done with it, um, you definitely will want to save it as a layered format, and you will go back to loading it as a layered format through that choice. All right, so these are the, the more typical ways to load an image initially. And uh, let's see some other ways. So, so we have a open, we just saw, we have importing a couple of other options there. And there's also a whole collection of import plugins. So some of them might also be kind of interesting, especially the raw format. If you work with uh, camera raw, this might be useful as well. Uh, there's a browser and there's a batch browser and that allows you to do conversions of images as well. Um, one of the things that I think is really important for you to discover as well is the general file converter, right? Now, so that one um, will be really useful in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, you can, you can go and open from the general file converter, you can go and open uh, images and let's see here I'm in the in a folder with uh, animator doing some projects on that and so let's say I'm, I'm grabbing the uh, this one here right and uh, you can see it's, it supports several formats so if you have your bitmap files or GIF, JPEG, EXIF um, and a few others those those are really great uh, th those are natively supported in the file converter in the general file converter so so I would recommend that you you uh, use that mechanism if you want to to work with these formats in particular and and typically Windows will recognize them and be able to show you thumbnails or other styles different ways to to view them and so that's a very familiar navigation environment and so when you click that to open it it's not in dog waffle yet it's still in here in where I loaded it which is the general file converter Right, so the general file converter uh, converts it, loads it, and also uh, views it. You can actually have it zoom to fit, click on that. And so that way, even if you make this a little bit smaller, it will, it will dynamically zoom to fit into your window here. Uh, but the, the ultimate goal is to work between this program. This is a standalone little program by itself, right? And what happens is that you can, you can close Dog Waffle and you can still have the image in here. But you can also, if Dog Waffle is running, you can go to the image menu and connect to Dog Waffle and then export to PD, right? Or if you have an image in PD, you can import it from PD. In fact, it does that automatically when you first launch the general file converter. The GFC is, is um, looking for Dog Waffle and likes to work with it. And if it finds a connection to it, it imports the image that currently lives in Dog Waffle. And so uh, that's why initially I saw the fish right in there. But I'm going to export to PD this image here now. And so that will replace the image inside of Dog Waffle. And so there we are. Um, and <coughs> so that's, that's another way that you can use, um, that you can work with images you already have in, in, um, on, your, on your computer in a file. All right, so we have uh, open, we have a couple of import mechanisms, uh, special modes, scanning also. If you have a, a, a scanner, you can uh, put some images, uh, some printed material on the scanner and get those directly into Dog Waffle. In fact, there's a multi-scan capability in the animation menu. Now, you wouldn't have this animation menu with the uh, artist uh, version. The artist edition doesn't do animation. <coughs> but the uh, Howler edition, PD Pro Howler, um, you do definitely have that, and you do have the ability to, uh, to do multiple scans, uh, to scan multiple images. Now, um, that's actually something you will see th right here as a, an option to scan frames. Let's say you already have frames, images, but multiple ones of those, right? Sequences, a sequence of images. You can load that here, load sequence, right? So with load sequence, you'll basically navigate through your folders to find the folder containing multiple images. And once you have identified um, that folder, you, you'll see a bunch of images. Again, here you can also select what type of images you're particularly looking for, uh, either any images, all of them, or just something specific like uh, maybe a JPEG. And so let's go look for, I think I have a folder on the E drive under, let's click uh, animator, and it might be on the pics. No, those are singles. Rendered maybe. No, 
textures. I forget where they are. Well, there's something hairy thing, but these are individuals. I don't think I rendered those as a sequence. Well, maybe I did. Look at that. Oh, one, two, three, four. This could be hard to say. Um, you know, you really want to know what it is you're working with and where they are, where those images are. I thought I had something like a, a sequence of more images, but let's let's take this. Why not? So post images, I have um, an image number one and then a bunch of others, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So I have a total of 10 images. And I'll assume they're all the same size. They better be, right? That's a condition for this uh, importer uh, to load the image sequence is that they all should be the same dimensions, like 640 by 480 or, or 1024 by 768. Whatever the dimension is, they should all have the same dimensions. And that normally happens automatically. Let's say this is a rendered animation from uh, maybe a 3D walk sequence in Poser or some 3D program of any type. Uh, typically, they all will have the same dimensions. So I'll click the first one, and actually I click and drag, and what happens is that it selects which ones you want to load, right? So you need to s select at least two because we're talking about an animation, and it's not really much of an animation if you only pick one. So make sure you select at least two if you want to preview that and see if it, you know, what it looks like, and you don't want to necessarily wait for all of them to be loaded. So let's see um, if we do. Oh, and. You know what? I just had an idea. Maybe the reason why I don't see that longer sequence is that they are in a different format. Maybe they're PNGs. Let's go back here on the pictures, models. Where did I render those? You know, well, let's see them all. That's really what you should do when you when what I should do. And I don't remember where I put them, right? <laughs> but but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's all there is. There's a bunch of AVI files here. Those we can load too, but that would not be through the load sequence. That would be through the load AVI option. So, let's see, yeah, looks like I'm stuck with those JPEGs. All right, so let's go back. Uh, doesn't matter, that's the only thing I have here, but I can filter it to that. And let's go, let's go with just three images and load that selected group of images. And so one after the other, these images are being imported. And uh, you now have three images there, right? So um, let's say we want them all. Well, let's just go back to animation load sequence and it remembers where we were last. It also remembers our last selection. It still shows them highlighted. Right? So that makes it a little bit faster and easier, more convenient. And now we can have all of these selected and load that selection. This will replace the animation. Let's go and load those. So now we have 10 images loaded one by one. All right, and so that's, that's an idea. That's, that's an example of how another mechanism by which you can load images that are on a, uh, on a file uh, in a folder. Uh, maybe you have a camera, like a digital camera, where you can uh, rent, you can record a whole sequence. Uh, like on my Android fo phone, I can, I can press once and then it records a whole batch of images, uh, like a fire, um, a fire sequence, and then that way um, you have maybe 30 frames of, or more. You know, maybe um, you have a video, like an MP4 that you converted, that you extracted the frames from, and that's a really typical way to load it, is to load it as a sequence. We have one more to explore, and that's to load an AVI. If you have an AVI file, maybe it's a short clip, you know, maybe it's something very short, but one of the frames in there, you know, you're going to like and you want to keep. Um, and by the way, here is sequence one. I don't know why I couldn't see that. That's really what I think I was interested in seeing initially. Um, but. Um, We'll go back to that. No, you know what? Let's do that right now. Let's go back because I want to see if that's where I was or where I should have been. So let's load sequence. And I am under rendered is where I saw that. I'm not seeing that. That is too odd. Uh, oh, maybe it's in a different folder. It's this one. There you go. I think I have it. It's under daily dose animator sequence one. There it is. All right. So I think that was a PNG. I don't remember for sure, but yep, there it is. All right. So here's an image capture that I did um, and I saved it. Uh, looks like there's about 30 frames. All right. So again, same thing. We select perhaps just two or three of those to, to do an initial selection just to see if that's really the sequence we want. And uh, it's actually very, uh, fairly large image. Um, and let's go and squeeze it. Yep. And it actually is a, a screen capture of uh, some session in Animator. I don't know that there will be much uh, interesting stuff to look at inside that short sequence, but it's, it's good enough to just see how to use that in general. So what we can do is we can load the sequence again. There it is. 
and this time as we saw we can load the whole sequence um, there's quite a number of frames at least 30 or so probably more and so I'm gonna load them all and they're probably all at uh, 1280 by 720 which is usually the size at which I record and uh, let's see what that looks like once it's all loaded it's still loading a few more frames right now and then once I have all of this loaded I can go and play it as an animation okay let's give it a few more seconds you know in the meantime I can perhaps release some memory if I don't need those other items that I had stored away like this one here the general file converter it's a separate program so it actually runs in its own address space but um, this one here is still uh, looking for more memory and I'm gonna go free up one or two other things and uh, so that basically will uh, complete this brief uh, walkthrough of how to load images there are so many different ways and you can uh, load a whole sequence you can load a whole movie the, oh I don't remember what that was that was kind of a a quick walk through uh, like a time-lapse recording and uh, how I modeled sort of a very basic satellite um, 3d model all right so uh, in fact you know one thing that we would want to do with that too is perhaps focus on just a portion of the image right let me use the shift and the control key and the right button to zoom out and as you see now as I'm stepping through these images there's a really interesting view in the upper left that's the front view there's a top view the left view and the perspective view that was in my uh, animator program so in the animator program maybe I'm interested in just a perspective view maybe I just want to capture that so what I'm gonna do is create a mask a selection mask and that's under the image menu no excuse me that's under here this one the this tool the rectangle to alpha I'm gonna select about this much right and about this much here right and so that selection I can highlight it here showing the overlay a little bit so sure enough we have the pink non-selected and the clear view full color selected and I'm going to just crop to that image I'm gonna crop not just this one image but actually every image across the animation is gonna be cropped that way so let's go uh, crop to selection there you go and so that way I get a much smaller image focusing on just that part in the lower right quadrant and it's going to keep that on every single across single frames and so now I see just that animation and there's perhaps one more thing I could do is make sure that before I save this that the image dimensions are not odd that they are actually at least even numbers but maybe multiples of four or eight because if I save this ever back to an AVI or some other video formats some of these video formats don't like odd dimensions so if I go to image info I can see when I cropped it how did I you know accidentally crop it you don't really control the exact pixel value there unless you look for the numbers it's showing during the selection so the buffer width 760 wow that's a nice round number that's that's good and even let's keep it that way 384 is probably fine too let's just keep it that way you know but I mean I could I could resample that image uh, resample and 760 by 380 if I wanted I could go and perhaps um, not constrain it and, and squeeze it vertically a little bit not ideal but you know if it's only by by two or so pixels let's say if I go to uh, 386 um, it's not going to hurt it too much and it's barely going to be noticeable that there is a bit of a squeeze or an expansion in one axis direction and uh, so it's 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 just fine but that's really something you only need to do if you notice that there's something wrong later when you save it as an AVI file because when you save it as an AVI file most of the time will be fine but sometimes you have some odd dimensions and the codec that you're using on that AVI may not be happy with those dimensions all right so how is this loading an image you know this tutorial is also about, uh, supposed to be about loading images right well the thing is this is a whole sequence of images this was an AVI file it's or image uh, sequence uh, if it's an AVI same thing you have movies basically containing uh, you know frame sequences and you can extract them you can look at them and then finally decide which one you really want to keep okay maybe it's this one right so this image I'm interested in well let's let's just grab a snapshot of that uh, let's store a copy of that store image copy 
And what I'm going to do next is just to put that back into the whole framework here and dismiss the animation that way. I'm going to go and replace the existing image, creates a new image. And so that says, oh, wait, we want to replace the existing buffer, and it actually replaces the whole animation. All right. So, or does it? Oh, no, no, look at that. It actually replaces just that one image. <laughs> Silly me. All right. Been proven wrong again. Well, what we'll do next, though, is uh, to to free this animation then, because we could do that uh, explicitly as well. I thought it was going to do that for me, but uh, you know, I'll just do that explicitly. I'm going to say um, animation free. <laughs> there it is. Right, free the animation. And so now I have just one frame, and I can put this thing in. Just click it, and it puts that there. All right, so that, that image is now the one we're working with. And so that shows yet another way that we were able to load an image from file, even though that was a whole image sequence. But we identified from that sequence which image we really like. And then we deleted the animation and put this one image in there. So that's, that's another scenario that you'll see a lot. Now, sometimes you'll have to make some changes in what's in that image. Like you see a white line at the top, maybe you want to remove that. Well, one way to do that is to crop it again and eliminate or uh, get out of that uh, area. One thing what, what you could do for that is actually just reduce the dimension, shrink the selection, right? Right now it's reaching all the way to the top. So if you shrink the alpha uh, by just one or two pixels, it's probably going to make it a little bit smaller. Uh, wait, no, just select Control D to clear the selection. And, and then um, let's do select all. So the entire image is selected. And now let's see if we can shrink that. Shrink alpha. Let's make it by three or bigger. Yeah, it's not big enough to really show that. Uh, you know what? I'll do that manually. I'm going to go from here and just select it like so. All right. And you can use the control key and drag this around if you need to shift a little bit. Right, that, that will reposition the, the alpha. OK, and now we can crop to that like we did before. But this time, it's not through an animation. It's just a single image. So crop to selection. There you go. So now we don't have that uh, um, line at the top that was still bothering us. But there is still the text here, perspective. Let's say we want to get rid of that. Well, that's an easy one. We just grab. This is a single colored image at the bottom. The background is a single color. Or almost. I mean, who knows? Maybe there are slight variations. And you can tell so by using the, um, the pickup tool here, the turkey baster or color picker. And as you pick the colors, keep an eye on what your colors are doing here on the left side. All right? If you see any changes, let's say in the RGB values here, these numbers, if they change, if they change at all while you're grabbing the colors, then that means they're not all the same color. But right now, it's a one, 102, 102, 153 on my RGB values as I'm going through that. Check this out. It's not changing. All right. If I go into the white and the black of the perspective text, yes, it's changing all over. But the background itself is not. So that means it's a good, clean color, and it's, it doesn't have any noise, and it ha doesn't have any damage from who knows what compression as JPEG, if it were, and that sort of things. So that means I can actually grab a portion of this a background that's below the perspective, and then just stamp it down, right? <coughs> so that would be a really good way to do that. <coughs> Two ways to do that is, one is to say, let's do a rectangular selection around here, right? And then pick the color that we want. That's, uh, let's go with the color picker and pick it, and then just fill it in that area, right? So you use the color fill tool, the, the fill bucket, and give it the opacity and the tolerance, in particular, to write over the text, right? Because here, it's not writing over the text quite yet. I need to go really high on the tolerance. But now it's filling it all in. But it's containing it with the selection of the rectangle. If I did not have that selection mask, it would actually fill it over the entire image. All right, so that's one way to do that. What else can we do to uh, erase that? Um, that text. Well, one way that we can do, this is a paint program, so let's think through the brush, right, with the paint brush. What we'll do is we'll use this tool here, B uh, for uh, brush, shortcut B, let's use that, and pick a portion, uh, maybe the size of the perspective text, or maybe not, it could be smaller. And then uh, with the preview on, we can go to the brush tool, preview on, 
and we can see it right there right and so we'll just stamp it down and you stamp it down two three four times and you're done so that's really another example of where you know you can do this really quickly and let me undo that and actually do this the fastest way possible which is b4 uh, brush select something that's big enough to cover it in one stamp right and then just stamp it down once and oh i didn't have full opacity i guess or something else prevented it from totally erasing it so that you may need to go over it once or twice but the idea is in the end you don't see the text anymore all right control d to clear the selection mask and so at this point um, you know you got that image that we wanted to extract all <laughs> from the beginning we were looking for an image that was in an image sequence and we saw how to import that so I think that summarizes uh, some of the main ways to load images. And I can think of one or two other ways that uh, exploit some other tools in which there's also a save option, right? So sometimes you see, let's say, um, <coughs> let's, what is it, uh, menu, um, utilities. Uh, there are some tools here that uh, we, we only eventually go look for, and uh, like we see the what is it? Uh, utilities, other tools, the killer plugins. Here's the, the, the plugins panel, right? And this one, by the way, is evolving a lot. For version 8, you can see a lot more information about the plugins. You can see are they plugins or are they uh, filters, or like files. Uh, if you lo look at the Lua browser, that one has a similar structure now. And, but the, uh, the image in front, the icon here, shows that it's a, it's a file. Um, or like a text file, because it is a script, right? Whereas these guys are executables, and these are plugins in a more traditional sense, right? So um, there are plugins that uh, allow you to also image or save an image, you know, and sometimes you'll find that they can also load an image. So there's yet another way that you can load an image, all right? So basically, I guess the, the short and the short version of this uh, tutorial is to remember that file is not the only place where you can open a file. You definitely can, but uh, sometimes you'll find other ways, particularly the general file converter. Um, and, and then other ways in the animation menu, in the brush menu, in the image menu, where you can also access your images, your files. And that's really what I want you to explore and to um, take home from this tutorial, is uh, that it's not all just in the file menu. And, and to, so to end it, uh, one, one I'll do here is in the miscellaneous category, uh, you'll see that there is also a couple of uh, filters, some of them, uh, let's see, I think it's the PD, what is it, dog, dog Lua browser, forget which one it is, there's a animation oriented, well there's a couple of output and input plugins too, it's not the one I was thinking about though, I'm looking for, fil it's not on the filters, maybe I dis uh, maybe I uninstalled it, or maybe I didn't install it on this one, yeah, well I was looking for one that uh, has also some options for import and export, and um, it's, um, it's, it's animation uh, oriented. Um, we'll find it at some point. Uh, I just probably need to reinstall it. You know, lesson learned. There are a lot of different places where you can uh, load the images and, uh, or save them. And uh, it's for you now to explore and enjoy.